On November 23rd of this year, members of the 4th Avenue Church of Christ in Franklin, Tennessee, anxiously awaited the introduction of their new preaching intern. A student from David Lipscomb University named Lauren King, the daughter of a preacher in the area, was that new preaching intern. When she enrolled at Lipscomb, she said she was a communications major. But somewhere during those early years of college, she felt called to change that major to Bible and ministry with an emphasis in youth ministry. She did three internships as a youth minister. Then she decided she also felt called to have an emphasis in actual preaching. In order to have that emphasis, she had to have an internship. And so the Lipscomb officials made a few phone calls to a few select congregations that they felt would be open to the idea of a woman preacher. One of them being the Fourth Avenue congregation there in Franklin, Tennessee. Minister Patrick Mead welcomed the new intern to the stage with great applause and hoopla from the crowd. And then Lauren began to preach on a Sunday morning to the mixed assembly. The Fourth Avenue Church proudly shared the news with the brotherhood at large uh, this week by, by uh, 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 releasing a video that had interviews and uh, uh, history of the story itself and then intercut with snippets of, of her preaching on the stage to the people. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 2 that you ought to be ashamed. He said, but you are puffed up. I think that's exactly what was happening. This congregation was proud, puffed up in itself, and should have rather mourned the digression that they were bringing into the church. In the 19th century, during that particular digression, those who opposed innovations into the church were despised such things as instrumental music, religious titles, missionary societies. David Lipscomb, for whom the university, David Lipscomb University is named, David Lipscomb uh, himself was one of those who was uh, uh, fighting the digression and trying to hold to the pattern of the New Testament. He was lampooned in a cartoon once depicted as an old lady standing on the the seashore and as a tidal wave of change was coming in, he was sweeping it back out into the ocean. And people were laughing and guffawing at David Lipscomb trying to stop the tides of time. Time would vindicate Lipscomb, though, in his opposition to denominationalism. And those of the digression eventually left the church and the disciples of Christ were born. Today, we see those same seeds of digression in the church. Division over the issues of worship, leadership, yes, instrumental music, missionary society and parachurch organizations, and even the role of women within the church. They are splitting the church from the inside out. And those who seek the old paths, in Jeremiah 6, those who are set to stand in the gap and stand up for the truth are, will once again be vindicated when those of a digressive mindset drift so far from the shores of truth and into destruction. Brethren, we, we've got to get our brooms out. And even if we're the last one standing on the shore, sweeping back the tide, We need to sweep back the devil's tide before we are lost to its destruction as well. How did we get here? How did we get from Paul's admonition, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 35. How did we get from that to Miss Lauren King preaching before the Sunday morning assembly? 
as I watched with a broken heart the video itself. Several answers to that question came to my mind about how we got here. In order to get to that place, the first thing we've got to do is ignore Bible authority. You've got to ignore passages like Colossians 3 and verse 17 that tells us, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. That is by the authority that Jesus himself has. Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus declares, All authority, both in heaven and on earth, has been given unto me. And so we look to him for our answers in everything outside the church, but especially inside the church, because he has been given head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23. When we go to the Bible and we read what God says about the role of women, we, we see, let the women keep silent in the assemblies or in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, 1 Corinthians 14. Another clear-cut passage in 1 Timothy 2 and verses 11 and 12, let a woman learn in silence with all submissions, and I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man but to be in silence. We live in an age where gender lines are being erased. The most extreme examples in our own nation are those who deny that there are any differences mentally, emotionally, or physically between men and women. That's extreme. But the secular world is trying to erase those lines. And as a result, the church, often not wanting to be left behind, is following suit and trying to erase the lines of gender. Then we need to open our hands and minds to all things, even against these clear injunctions against women preaching in mixed assemblies. But you've got to ignore 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 to hire women as preachers. Several reasons are cited for ignoring the Bible. Some come along and say, well, the purpose of the Bible isn't to give us a list of do's and don'ts. The purpose is to foster a relationship with God. But let me tell you, that answer denigrates the very relationship that they claim to promote. Think about it. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Keeping his commandments means that we recognize God has set certain limitations, certain parameters in which the church, church must, must work. But you've got to ignore those parameters. You've got to ignore that pattern. Once we follow that pattern, though, that promotes the relationship with God that we want to have. If you love me. If you're not going to take the time to keep my commandments, then you don't love me. And what kind of relationship is that if we overtly tell Christ and God we do not love them by the actions we do? Jesus had a relationship with the Father. Even though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Now by this we know that we know him. We know God, and here is how we know God. Here's how we know that we know God. 1 John 2 and verse 3, if we keep his commandments. How can we have a relationship with someone that we do not know? And how can we keep his commandments if we're going to ignore plain Bible teaching? You can't simply say, well, the Bible is not a list of do's and don'ts. I know the Bible is not a list of do's and don'ts. The Bible is a book that does draw us into a relationship with God, but it is based upon changing our actions to follow God's will instead of our will. Does that result in parameters of some things to do and some things we should not do? Absolutely. Absolutely. Some say, well, the prohibitions were cultural, not prescriptive. 
God is not telling us what we need to do. He's not telling uh, the church at Corinth and the church at Ephesus through Paul's letter to Timothy. He's not telling them, uh, uh, this is how I want you to be. He was dealing with uh, an immediate cultural situation there. In fact, in the video, on the, in the interview section, in one of the interviews, they're interviewing the preacher, Patrick Mead. And he says exactly that. He is not, through Paul, Changing everything in Scripture. These two Scriptures, he says, these two passages, we're talking about a specific instant in two cities. Well, what if there had been three? Would three have been enough? Four? Five? How many times does God have to say it in order for it to be true? Whether or not we like the, the implication, it was a prohibition by Paul and really it had nothing to do with culture. Look, look at 1 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 13, when he gives the reason why women are to keep silent in the church. For Adam was first formed. He did not say, because in your particular city, women are oppressed. He did not say, because there is a machismo among the men in your particular area. He said, because... Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. When we read that verse, we see that, that word for. In the Greek, it's the word gar. It indicates for us reason. Reason for what was just stated. Women must keep silent in the church. Why? The reason is, is because Adam was first formed, and then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, but Eve was doesn't sound like a cultural thing. It sounds pretty universal, doesn't it? In what areas of the world was Adam not formed first? In what cities? Is it this way in all the world except Franklin, Tennessee, that Adam was formed first, but in Franklin, Eve came first? In all the world, was Eve deceived and fell into the transgression first, except in Franklin, Tennessee? No. It's universal. Some, some might look at these, this Bible authority and denigrate the church by mixing with it human philosophy. And we've, we've heard them for a, a few decades, such buzzwords as our heritage. You know what? When, when you read in an article and it says our heritage, or you hear someone say our heritage, look out. Look out. That is a buzzword. Or... Our fellowship, our traditions. In the interview with Miss King, she kept saying, our tribe. You see, the idea is that we have our heritage, but there are other heritages out there. Or we have our tradition, but there are other just as viable traditions or other fellowships that are just as much in fellowship with God as we are. Or our tribe versus their tribe. When you hear such buzzwords like that, look out. They're tacitly, tacitly saying we are just one among any. And this hits close to home. I had an elder from Teague, Texas, just down the road, mention our tradition of no instruments. He said, I'm comfortable with our tradition of no instruments. Our what? These aren't just our ideas. We, we get these from the Bible. And we can't just dismiss them that way. Or in Richland Hills, Rick Ashley equated instrumental music and praise teams with multiple cups on the table or located preachers. Well, it's silly if you think that, that there are certain directives that we've got to follow. Uh, you, you may condemn instrumental music and, and uh, 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 praise teams, but you know there are some that will, will condemn you for having a located preacher or condemn you for, for having multiple cups. And as he said that, the entire congregation laughed and guffawed to think of the silliness that anyone would, would actually believe that there was a pattern. In order for the digression to take place... Authority of the Bible must be ignored. And change agents are quick to point out that they are not liberals. Hey, we're not liberals. 
Because the classic term liberal the, the, in, in religion refers to those who, who deny the inspiration of the Scriptures, who deny the deity of Christ. And they'll say, hey, we're not liberal because we believe in the deity of Christ and we believe in the inspiration of the Scriptures. But what good is belief in the inspiration of the Scriptures if you're not going to follow what they say? If you're just going to explain it away? Call yourself what you want to call yourself, but let me tell you, you're not following the truth. Number two, not only do you have to ignore Bible authority, but you have to exalt personal preference. You've got to put something in its place. When biblical authority is ignored, something is going to take its place. If the Bible doesn't make our choices for us, something else will. Lauren King, in an interview, explained her authority. Here's how she came to the conclusion that it's okay for her to preach. A lot of ways have been perceived, or, or a lot of ways I have per, been, been perceiving the Lord's voice is through having peace when I walk through open doors. If I have an unpeaceful heart, then that's not really where I'm supposed to be. But if I have peace about where I am, where I'm going, then that's, that's the Lord telling me yes. Where's the book, chapter, and verse on that? Oh, we don't need that. I feel at peace, so it must be right. I felt a, a tug of emotion, so this must be it. But you know, God talks about man's ability to make choices for his own self. He says, for example, in, in, in Proverbs 14 and verse 12, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the, the end is the way of death. In Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 26, 12, do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for the fool than that person. Or Proverbs 3 and verse 7, the well-known, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. God tells us if we just go by how we feel, if we go by our preferences, we are walking a path to destruction, a path of foolishness, a path of digression. And digressive supplant the plain teaching of the, of the Word of God for their own desires when it comes to such things as worship and the role of women or marriage and the family and fellowship. At one point in the interview, Ms. King uh, uh, mentions how people came to her and said, you know, my mom had the same gifts you do, but she didn't get to use them. But let me tell you something. Women have been used in the church and using their gifts and talents in the church since the beginning. Think about Phoebe. Think about Priscilla. There are other women that, are, women that are also mentioned in the Bible, but these are two that we, we know well from Acts chapter 18, from, from Romans chapter 6. We know their names. They have come down to us as, as women who, who worked in the church. But you know how they worked? They worked under the roles which God had given to them. Just because we read about a woman uh, uh, teaching in evangelism alongside her husband doesn't mean she was preaching from the pulpit. It's really a false dichotomy. If preaching from the pulpit is somehow denying gifts, then not only are women denied, but all the men that don't stand up and preach, they're denying their gifts as well. That's not true. There are men who serve and work in the church with talents, including speaking talents, that never preach from the pulpit, and they still use their gifts to glorify God. One does not have to preach from the pulpit to a mixed assembly in order to fulfill their gifts or use their gifts for God. It's a false dichotomy. It's not that women have been disallowed to use their gifts. It's that they have a personal preference. I want to do it this way, and any other way is not good enough for me. Brethren, that's an arrogant attitude. That's a defiant attitude. But according to her words, she feels at peace. 
The digressives supplant the Bible with their personal feelings. The third thing that I, I thought about, and there's a lot you could come across with, but not only do you have to use your personal preferences in, in line with the Bible, but you have to really hate correction. You, you can't tolerate someone saying, you know what, that's not right. The church was designed to be autonomous, to protect the purity of other congregations if one fell away. We, for example, in West Hill, are not necessarily tainted because of the decision that was made in Franklin, Tennessee. We are autonomous, and so we, we keep our purity. Yet, autonomy doesn't mean that we live in a vacuum. We are uh, our brother's keepers. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9, like Jeremiah and Isaiah, the apostles and, and a host of preachers of the past, we have an obligation to warn brothers and sisters who are slouching toward destructions. Certainly we agree that we do not have authority over these other congregations. We're not saying that we do. But love compels us to warn others about their directions. But the digressives hate correction. They don't want to hear the error of their ways. Besides, most of them consider themselves better educated, more spiritual, and wiser than what they often term conservative churches. In the early 1980s, a new generation of separatists and change agents arose. They were tired of being segregated from the rest of the religious world <coughs> and wanted to be like the denominations around them. It sounded very much like the call to be like the other kings around us in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Men like Ira Rice and Johnny Ramsey and Tom Warren, uh, Wayne Jackson, began in those early days to warn the church about the dangers of these new ideas, which they admitted very quickly were really just rehashed ideas from the first century through the 19th century. These are not new. The idea of women uh, uh, going beyond their roles is not new. That's why Paul had to write about it in, to the church at Corinth in the first place. That's why he had to remind Timothy about it in the first place, because it was already an issue in the first century. It was an issue in the second century, in the third century, in the fourth century, in the fifth, in the sixth, all the way up to today. It is just rehashed ideas that have already been shown to be out of step with God. But these men, like David Lipscomb, were hated for their desire to correct brethren, to warn them of the dangers. But you know what they did? They continued to sweep the tide away. Miss King said in her interview, there's a movement coming. There sure is. But brethren, it is the movement away from the truth. The Word of God they claim to respect is useful for the correction they despise. All Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17. Of course, Mead, uh, the Fourth Avenue Church, Miss King herself and other digressives do not listen to this because they, they look and say, well, that, that's Paul, not Jesus. I was astounded when the preacher went on to explain, I do not read Jesus through Paul, but Paul through Jesus. We no longer read all the Bible as equal. Well, why not? Why do we not read the Bible as equal? Why do we not believe that God's authority was binding upon the people of the Old Testament? Why do we not read that there is a new covenant under which we live? Why can we not recognize that both of those statement, statements are of equal importance? For us to truly understand the new covenant, we have to have some inkling of what the old covenant is. We no longer read all the Bible as equal. He indicated, he went on to say, Paul was a fellow student just like us. I look at Paul's life and I'm astounded at the decisions that he made. 
at the courage and the boldness with which he preached. And I say, I want to aspire to that. But you know, there is a, a, another huge difference between me and Paul. Paul was inspired by God. To state that Paul and us were exactly the same is to deny the inspiration that Paul had. It's to deny the very words. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge the things that I am writing to you, that they are the command of the Lord. But no, no, we, we don't listen to Paul. We don't listen to the correction of Paul. He's got it all wrong. You know, regardless of how we feel, God's word corrects us and leads us and trains us. And, and we can't just turn our back and despise correction. Adam Fawn, preacher for the Ninth Avenue Church in, in Haleyville, Alabama, wrote a, a, a particular blog about this situation. And in it he said, I'm sad. I'm sad that this move didn't surprise me. We've seen it coming. We are facing a new division over ancient lies. It's not just about women's role or instrumental music. It's about how we view the Bible and ascertain authority from it. While, while the name on the building may be the same, brethren, the hearts inside are as different from the church and soundness as light is from dark. And we need to be aware of these digressive teachings. Why? We need to be aware, not because we hate these people, we certainly don't. But, but we pray for the hearts of those who are caught up in these innovations as they see them, these new ways, that their, their minds might be open to the Word of God and its pattern. We, we need to know these things so that we may warn people about tampering with the truth and the destruction that it brings to us. We need to know about these things to keep watch on ourselves, lest we also drift away, Hebrews chapter 2. Pay attention to the things which you've heard, lest happily you drift away from them. We need to know about these things so we can take broom in hand and sweep back the devil's tide. I've got to tell you, I hate preaching lessons like this, but I love the truth more. And we've got to speak these words. We've got to tell these situations the truth of God's message is our salvation. It's our life. Jesus Christ himself is the truth and he gave himself for our redemption. So as I love the truth, as I am compelled by the truth to speak it, to defend it, to preach it, whether I like, like it or not, it's what God has given me to do. in each one of us. But that salvation that comes from the truth is available, every, available to every one of us. The defense of the truth, to read it and to know it and to follow it, is available to every one of us. It doesn't take special knowledge. There's no special illumination that you need. It's simply a heart that says, I want to submit to my God. And whatever he says, I will do. And he says to you tonight, if you're not a Christian, become one. Don't wait. Don't put it off. You, you know what needs to be done. That you believe in Jesus and you're baptized for the remission of your sins. There is no other way to heaven but this way. And if you slide into the world, if you are lured away by the temptations of the devil, God has made provisions for you. He wants you back. And his arms are open to your repentance tonight. If there's something in your life you've got to deal with, if repentance needs to be made, if confession needs to be done, if baptism is what you need, all things are ready if you will come tonight while we stand and while we sing.